In Russia, beyond the Arctic Circle lies Antipayuta, a Nenetse village. The Nenetses are the last reindeer breeders in the Siberian Great North. Edik is a Nenetse. He's 14 years old and a boarder at the village school for the past seven years. Throughout this time, Edik has only seen his parents once a year. He's learned Russian and knows how to read and write. This year, he will complete his compulsory years of education, a throwback to the former Soviet regime. If he wants, he can now leave school for good. It's spring vacation. All the boarders at Antipayuta have been impatiently waiting for it. They can now go back to their families whom they haven't seen for a long time. They return to the tundra, so dear to both young and old Nenetses. The Sovkovs, the agricultural cooperatives from the Soviet era, still function in the region. The Sovkov, in fact, is responsible for the children returning each year to their families. Edik hasn't seen his parents for months. He knows that his father is counting on him and is bound to ask him to choose between school and his family. The choice frightens the youngster. It's always an emotional moment for Edik when he returns to his parents' Chum, the Nenetse's traditional home, and where traditional tundra food consisting of naturally frozen reindeer meat and raw fish is waiting for him. Edik is still not a man. At the dinner table, he sits in the area reserved for women and children. If he proves worthy of his ancestors, only then will he sit with the men. The time has come for my son to learn how to raise reindeer. The future will tell us if he's going to choose to continue. Maybe he'll decide to come with us. Maybe he'll keep studying to learn other things. I don't know. I really think I want to keep studying. You do? But first you've got to grow up. I'll teach you how to raise them, and when you become a man, you can decide. Four thousand kilometers south of Antipayuta, in Mongolia, the winds of the Gobi Desert crash against the Altai Mountains. Zolbo and Altegan are brothers. They're nomad animal breeders and live under the benevolent authority of their grandfather. He's ordered them to gather the camels which have strayed far from the camp, as they usually do when grass is scarce. In the Gobi Desert, rain is rare, and often a few weeks early or late, which can totally upset the vegetation cycle. Only their vast experience enables nomadic camel breeders to survive in this unfertile universe to which they are so attached. Oh, 
Natsag watches his grandsons from the entrance to his yurt as they return to camp with the family's 80 camels. He looks worried. The last two summers have been too hot. The drought has hit us very hard. Many families have lost their herds. They go to Ulaanbaatar, penniless. I like desert life. I won't give it up. My herd isn't enormous, but there's not enough grass for all my animals. I'll split the herd in two. I'll only keep half of them and give the other half to one of my two grandsons, Altagan or Tsolbo. They both know camels very well. With our people, as soon as a child gets to be three or four years old, we teach him to take care of the baby camels. Zolbo is married. It might be a good thing for him, but it is the spirits who will decide. We'll see. <laughs> Old Natsak's clan is one of the last Bactrian camel breeding families. These camels are raised for transportation, for their meat and for their milk. A great deal of experience is required to breed them. A female can only give birth to one baby every two years, and the infant remains fragile for the first years of its life. The entire family looks after the animals with great care. Their nomadic breeder's life is closely and essentially linked to the herd. Natsag's animals are hungry. The camel's milk is not very abundant, and the little ones don't have as much as they need. Natsag knows of a pasture not too far away, but will there be enough grass there? Four families make up Gena's clan. Together, their herd numbers 4,000 reindeer. The men of the clan know each one of their animals. They lasso those who are going to pull the sleds. Edik has never rounded up the reindeer with the men of his clan. He's afraid of being in the way and prefers to stay on the sidelines. Gena, however, doesn't agree. He wants to see his son at work and orders him to participate.
Everything happens very quickly. The reindeer are fast and numerous. Edik has trouble recognizing them and can't decide where to position himself. The youngster feels even more clumsy as he admiringly watches the skill of Gena and the others. Gena overtakes a young male. The mating season is ending, and he marks the animal for castration. Edik is disappointed by his poor performance. True to Nenetze tradition, Gena sacrifices a reindeer in honor of his son's return. The animal is strangled with the head facing east in reverence to Num, the master of the sky and creator of the sun and the summer. Gena cuts off the sacrificed animal's left ear and pours its blood on Edik's forehead to bring his son health, luck and fortune. The ear is placed on the kekekan, the sled loaded with sacred objects. <laughs> Nothing is wasted in the tundra. The animal's skin will be used to cover the chum for bedding or for clothing. <laughs> The animal's organs are a delicacy when eaten raw. The men serve themselves first, and when they've had their fill, the women and children join the feast. In the past, the Russians knew very little about the Nenetze's customs and totally misunderstood the nature of this ritual. They thought these nomads were cannibals and called them Samoyedes, the people who eat themselves. For the Nenetze's, however, it's a rare occasion to eat food that hasn't been frozen. In addition, the liver, the heart, and fresh blood supply them with precious vitamins. Altegan and Zolbo have begun exploring the entire region in search of new pasture. Mountains, desert steppes, and snow-covered dunes create an immense landscape in which pasture land is very rare. Goats are also raised here. Although they produce one of the world's finest cashmeres, their increasing numbers have worn out the earth and disorganized traditional breeding. <laughs> Hi. 
Altagan is disappointed. His task is particularly difficult, but he has to keep looking. Zolbo climbs to the tops of the dunes to get a broader view. There's no grass to be seen on the horizon. Has he unknowingly offended the master spirits of nature? Are they taking revenge by moving the pastures further away? The Mongols believe that there are many living things that cannot be seen. The universe, they feel, is filled with invisible and omnipresent spirits. Water, plant, and animal spirits. Spirits of the dead living in the desert, haunting the steppes, the hills, and the mountains. Men must live in collusion with them. Altagan will be getting married soon. If he finds good pasture, he is more likely to be designated by his grandfather and thus gain his independence. But he's exhausted and discouraged. He's been looking for two days without any success. Suddenly, however, The grass is there, the seeds are good, the camels are saved. Near the camp, the men have spotted wolf tracks. As long as there are predators in the area, the herd has to be watched night and day for as long as the threat exists. Watching the herd is a task traditionally given to the youngsters. Edik mounts the guard a few kilometers from the campsite. At dusk, in the midst of the herd, Edik gets ready to spend his first night alone in the tundra, with its bad weather, prowling wolves, and the boy's own personal fears. Hours go by, and the long glacial night is about to begin. It's 50 below Celsius. Antipayuta is far away now, 
So is the peace and safety of his boarding school. The night belongs to Na, the master of the moon and darkness. He lives in the depths of the earth, and he never thaws. Numb from the cold, Edik can barely move. In the end, he falls asleep as the wolves stalk their prey. Where are you going? 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 Back at the camp. Altagan, proud of his success, announces to old Natsag that he's found a free pasture beyond the dunes to the east, a day's walk away. Ma, Tsulbo's wife, asks Altagan about his brother, since she's had no news of him. Altagan hasn't seen him, and the whole family is worried. <laughs> Zolbo is far away, beyond the mountains. He's alone, lost in a sandstorm, and exhausted. In anticipation of misfortune, Natsag questions the oracle with the help of sacred coins. <laughs> The coins, however, don't reveal anything, and the family is more worried than ever. The next day, Zolbo still hasn't come back but it's the herd that determines the life of the clan, and it's therefore time to leave. The yurts are taken down, and the animals are loaded in a few hours. The caravan sets out with its 80-strong camel herd.
Hedik goes looking for the reindeer who strayed while under his responsibility. His mother is worried. The boy has never gone far from the camp on his own, and this is an expedition that might last several days. Gena is confident. All young Nenetsis have faced this ordeal at one time or another. Edik will prove that the blood of his ancestors flows through his veins. He'll manage just fine. This time, Edik faces the unknown. He ventures into the huge, unforgiving desert of ice, all alone with his reindeer and his dog. The news arrives from the south. With the coming of spring, the tundra is warming up. It's time to head north. Edik's mother doesn't want to leave camp as long as her son hasn't come back, but Gena insists. Before long, the ice in the rivers will be too fragile to support the herd. They have got to leave now. Summer will soon be here. It will not only be hot, but there will also be swarms of mosquitoes. The clan gets ready to leave. Tasks are clearly defined, and everyone knows exactly what he or she has to do. The men, women, and children take down the chooms and load the sleds with all the everyday equipment they need. Reindeer don't take the heat very well. In the spring, the Nenetsis head north in search of cooler weather near the sea. The journey entails several exhausting weeks, breaking camp every three or four days. <laughs> Gena and his wife finish their final preparations. Gena places a specially made doll on a sled a small idol representing the ancestor spirit which protects the family. After two hours, everything is ready for the departure. The first sleds take off, after which the caravan moves out in total unison. Gena leads the group on a light, easy-to-handle sled. The chief of the clan comes the sleds of the women and children. Then come the food supply sleds, the chum with its 150 reindeer, and the sacred sled with its priceless load. With its 45 sleds and more than 4,000 head of cattle, the imposing caravan stretches for several kilometers.
Up to now, Edik has failed the tests required to become a reindeer breeder. Gena is worried about these failures. He begins to wonder if his son will be able to find his way back to the camp. Natsag's clan has passed the mountains. The nomads slide along the sand. They never build anything durable, since no one can possess the land. It belongs to the spirits, not to man. Their life is constant movement. Their only wealth is their herd. It's the number and the quality of the herd that gives the breeder his place in the social hierarchy. It's the camel who decides, and it's the grass, the rain, and nature in general, which the chief of the clan must read like an open book. He observes, he remembers, he senses when it's time to go and he leaves, with the animals and the people of his clan following behind him. At the pasture, someone is waiting. Zolbo has picked up his brother's trail and prefers to stay there rather than join the caravan. In this way, he hopes to prove that he knows as well as his brother how to find the grass the animals need. The yurt's circular shape is symbolic of the universe. The interior is the core. The central pillar is in direct relation to the Earth's axis. That is how the spirits go in and out of the yurt. The atmosphere at dinner is relaxed. The clan has settled into a new pasture area. Everyone jokes around and recounts what he or she imagined had happened to Zolbo. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 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 
Edik has been walking for two days, searching for the missing and elusive reindeer. He's almost out of food. He looks stubbornly for the rare tracks that the wind hasn't erased. He orients himself by the sun when it breaks through the clouds and tries to follow the frozen riverbeds. The reindeer droppings scattered on the snow are fairly fresh, but Edik knows that sometimes the spirits try to fool men by putting them on the wrong track. A violent storm blows through the tundra. The temperature drops to 40 degrees below zero Celsius. Back at the camp, Gena watches the horizon with a worried look. The storm has been raging relentlessly for hours. Edik's mother is frantic. Why didn't Gena go with his son? Gena, however, stubbornly repeats that Edik will find his way. storm, exhausted, Edik continues on. It seems to him that he's been walking forever. Still no sign of the reindeer. The boy is fighting for his survival. He can't stop in this cold. Edik refuses to give in to the doubt that constantly gnaws away at him. What if the reindeer he's following are wild reindeer? Suddenly, familiar shadows emerge from out of the blizzard. Edik recognizes them immediately. They're the clan's reindeer. Relieved by what he sees, he momentarily forgets his fatigue. Edik's ordeal, however, is not over. As soon as the wind subsides, he must begin his trek back to the camp. <coughs> Mongol nomads begin training the camels they'll use for transportation when the animals are about four years old, after they've been castrated. A good camel trainer is skillful and knows how to show his authority. <coughs> the nostrils of the future mount are perforated with a piece of hard wood, which will be used to lead them. Zolbo climbs onto the back of the young camel, which is being mounted for the very first time. Zolbo dominates the animal with ease. 
Natsak judges his grandson's performance with an eye honed by years of experience. Zolbo is flawless. Tomorrow, Natsag will go to the Lama Chinbold to consult the stars. He needs the spirit's advice now. Natsag must decide which of his two grandsons will inherit the second herd. The entire clan goes to the Obu, a sacred cairn hanging on the side of the mountain where the spirits of the place live. The teachings of the wise men and the astrologists are very important in the Mongol world. They participate in all important family decisions. <laughs> By reciting the prayers, the old wise man pays tribute to the spirits of the Obu, and he consults the stars. To which of his two grandsons should Natsag confide half of his herd? The stars confirm Natsag's feelings. They designate Zolbo. Natsag is overjoyed. Zolbo is married, and the herd will give him the independence he needs to live as a free man. As for Altagan, he will have to wait. He'll stay with the old chief, Natsag, who will rely on him. The storm has subsided. Edik has found his bearings and his clan. The legendary sense of direction that is in every Nenetsu's blood has worked again. His success has given him confidence. It's a new Edik who stops his sled in front of his parents' chum. <laughs> the entire family celebrates Adik's return and his accomplishment. Gena invites the boy to eat with him. He has shown himself to be worthy of his ancestors and thus can sit with the men. <laughs> Next year, Edik will leave for the village of Antipayuta and continue his studies. He now knows, however, that he will live here. In the future, he will strive to live as his ancestors did, as a true Nenetsi, a free and courageous man.
It's one of the last cold days of spring. In the Gobi Desert, the heat comes on suddenly, and the problem of water quickly becomes vital. In the early morning, Natsag's family has already taken down a yurt and loaded it on the camels. Zolbo and his wife Ma get ready to leave with the herd that has just been entrusted to them. Camel's milk is thrown over the tracks of the couple as they leave for good luck. Zolbo, master of his own destiny, will now seek his road on the earth where the spirits of his ancestors reign. It is they who award the pastures, who determine the fertility of the herd and the prosperity of the breeders. From the north to the south of the huge expanse of Siberia, people have kept their roots and perpetuated their ancient culture of nomadic animal breeders. Edik, Altagan, and Zolbo, children of the steppes and of the tundra, all lovers of dry and often hostile lands, have retained the teachings of their elders in their hearts to become true men.